To talk more about misinformation in the media, we're joined by journalist and author Max Blumenthal, the founder and editor of The Grey Zone. Max, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. This coronavirus outbreak has spawned a whole new wave of conspiracy theories. It seems almost every day there's a new one. Uh, and one can understand this getting onto social media because those are largely unregulated platforms. But now we're seeing it creep into mainstream media, into some big marquee titles. What do you make of that? Well, I, I especially want to thank you for having me on because no U.S. network, uh, no independent U.S. network will have me on to debunk this conspiracy theory, which is being rolled out in mainstream media and pushed by the Trump administration, specifically by Mike Pompeo's State Department. It seems that no debate is allowed when uh, the U.S. regime change elite wants to roll out a conspiracy theory. But if a Chinese official, for example, the spokesperson of the Chinese foreign ministry introduces one about the virus escaping from Fort Detrick, all hell breaks loose and U.S. media is filled with condemnations. Um, at the gray zone, we, uh, I, along with my colleague Ajit Singh, really methodically debunked this conspiracy theory. And what we showed was, first of all, that it was first kind of tested through a trial balloon in the right-wing Washington Times, owned by the South Korean Unification Church, um, and debunked at the time by the Washington Post, along with a scientific consensus. And you have scientists um, from across the West in Nature magazine declaring absolutely definitively that this could not have escaped from a lab. COVID-19 could have not have escaped from a lab or been the product of lab manufacturing. Lancet magazine, 27 scientists saying the same thing. But then it came roaring back with a vengeance in April as the Trump administration was grappling with 40,000 deaths on its hands in the U.S., uh, seeking to point the finger at China. And it turned to a neoconservative columnist in the Washington Post opinion section, Josh Rogan, at the same newspaper that had originally debunked the theory. The State Department supplied cables, which Rogan proceeded to spin, claiming that there were safety issues at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, and suggesting through various sleights of hand that the virus could have escaped from the lab. And then his story was shared by leading lights of the liberal media, of the Democratic establishment. This was on April 14th. And the following day, it comes out on Fox News in coordinated fashion. And then the Trump administration begins to saber rattle at China, blaming it for all 40,000 deaths in the U.S. So that's this, that's how this conspiracy theory was revived. Um, and it's still out there. It's still alive in the ether with very little debunking or debate. Yeah, you mentioned it came out on Fox News. And I'm wondering how much coordination there is between some politicians and news outlets, because there was a Republican politician who blamed China for the outbreak. And on that very same night, uh, Fox was broadcasting this report saying that the virus came from a laboratory. Yeah, that was Senator Tom Cotton, who is really... Uh, the kind of pet project of the neoconservative movement. Um, and he was really uh, propped up by the billionaires behind the neoconservative movement, Paul Singer, Sheldon Adelson, to lead Trump's maximum pressure policy on Iran. But now that the um, new Cold War is turning towards China, uh, Tom Cotton is leading the charge there as well. And so in the morning, Brett Baer, who's a correspondent at Fox News, rolls out a evidence-free story insinuating that COVID-19 escaped from the Wuhan Institutes of Virology. He cites official U.S. sources, doesn't name them, says they have proof, but he has himself not seen it. And that night, Tom Cotton appears on Sean Hannity, the primetime Fox uh, opinion show, and declares that China is responsible for every death. They have blood on their hands and they have to pay the price. So this is obviously coordinated. And as I mentioned the day before, the Washington Post's columnist, Josh Rogan, a neoconservative who previously worked at the Japanese embassy, who has hung out with uh, his close friends with Orion Strategies, the lobbying firm which has had the contract for Taiwan, he, was, he received the State Department cables from Mike Pompeo's State Department to insinuate that there were safety issues at the Wuhan lab. So this whole thing was coordinated by the Trump administration, 
through the media, and then it comes back to hardliners like Tom Cotton. Then after Tom Cotton's spectacle on Fox News the following day, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, former CIA director, most militaristic member of the Trump administration, demands U.S. access to the Wuhan Institutes of Virology, pushing the conspiracy theory to a new level. You know, there are so many echoes here, uh, listening to you there, of what happened in the build-up to the Iraq war. In fact, in your piece, you compare this media onslaught uh, with the one uh, that tried to legitimize that Iraq war. Yeah, Josh Rogan here played the role of Judith Miller. Judith Miller was the New York Times correspondent who basically was the cipher or the sort of human bulletin board for neoconservative propaganda about Iraq possessing weapons of mass destruction, which provided the justification for the invasion of Iraq. Um, they had derived that phony intelligence from a uh, Iraqi defector named Curveball, who turned out to just basically be a paid asset who was lying. And Miller, through the New York Times, provided this neoconservative deception with the veneer of mainstream respectability, and it allowed the Bush administration and specifically the neocon civilians in the Pentagon to sell that story throughout the Beltway, including to Democrats. You saw Hillary Clinton and Senator Joe Biden advancing the WMD line, lie on the Senate floor. And that's what's happened here with the Washington Post and Josh Rogan. And again, there's been no pushback. That's why we did what we did at the gray zone, methodically dismantling this conspiracy theory and no U.S. network uh, will allow us to come on and debunk it. When you look at this kind of reporting, uh, Max, I mean, what are the dangers in reporting this kind of, well, unhinged conspiracy, conspiracy theories? Where we're hurtling full speed towards a new Cold War with a nuclear armed rising economic power that could quickly become a hot war if anyone knows the history of the tension around Taiwan. Uh, anything could happen. Um, the U.S. has, through the pivot to Asia, sought to encircle China uh, with its navy, and with military bases in, from Korea to Japan and elsewhere. So this is really a dangerous situation. And when you start accusing a uh, powerful uh, new rival of essentially manufacturing a disease that's killing tens of thousands of Americans, you're not only kind of invoking a yellow peril in the U.S. where Asian Americans are being targeted uh, with hate crimes, you're using extremely militaristic rhetoric that could lead toward world war. Obviously, that's not in the cards right now, but it's something every American should be concerned about. And then beyond that, you have an element in the national security state which, seek, which is seeking to justify record defense spending at the expense of America's health care system, which is in a state of catastrophe right now, as the coronavirus crisis clearly reveals. There was also some support for the Washington Post reporting from the Columbia Journalism Review. I mean, many people consider this to be a serious journal about the practice of journalism. Did that surprise you? Yeah, the Columbia Journalism Review is supposed to be a media watchdog, and I would have thought that they would have blown out, blown this conspiracy theory out of the water. Of course, if this had been a conspiracy theory that advanced the Russian or Chinese narrative, they would have done so. But instead, instead they, they wrote, one of their top editors wrote that Josh Rogan had uh, produced some bombshell reporting. And it was obviously an intelligence plant uh, that produced Josh Rogan's bogus reporting. It was obviously a State Department disinfo dump. Uh, but it wasn't just the Columbia Journalism Review. It was Chris Hayes, who's supposed to be the smart guy at MSNBC, who is sort of a, on the center left. It was Charles Blow, a anti-Trump, vehemently anti-Trump New York Times columnist who shared this phony story. Um, it, a, I saw a BuzzFeed editor share it and declare that it's absolutely plausible that the virus could have escaped from a Chinese lab. Um, you know, and I just thought of the irony of this Skripal poisoning in Salisbury, England, where there was the Porton Downs lab right near the poisoning. And anyone who suggested that Novichok could have been produced or escaped from that lab was immediately not just dismissed, but um, blacklisted as a Russian propagandist. But they're doing the exact same thing. Max, thanks so much for joining us.
Thanks for having me.